Let's just have a word of prayer before we open God's word today. Dear Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please open your Bibles this morning to the first chapter of the book of Acts. <coughs> Acts chapter 1. You know, here in Arizona, we are used to hot, dry conditions. Other than in the monsoon season of July and August, most of the year, much of Arizona experiences drought conditions. But the church is also going through a spiritual drought. In Scripture, rain represents the falling of the Holy Spirit. And there has been too little of the Holy Spirit for too long a time. The church has been going through a season of drought. When will the Holy Spirit latter rain ever come? It came once before. There's a scientific principle that says that identical circumstances will always produce identical results. So if we could find the circumstances that brought the spiritual rain before, then if we could simply duplicate those circumstances, we could be guaranteed that the rain would come again. And what were those circumstances that brought the early rain? Acts, the first chapter, and the 14th verse. This is speaking of the time when the disciples were in the upper room after Jesus' ascension, and they were awaiting the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Acts, the first chapter, and the 14th verse. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Let's look also at Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And then Acts, the second chapter, and verse 46. Acts 2, 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. All three verses says that they were together in one accord. Some translations say they were of one mind. The Amplified Bible says they were one in purpose. Brethren and sisters, when there was unity in the early church, there was Holy Spirit power. And when we duplicate the circumstances, God will duplicate the power. Our lesson today, where there is Christian unity, there is Holy Spirit power. Where there is unity, there is power. Now there need to be three kinds of unity before we can have the latter rain. Three kinds of unity before the drought will end. First of all, there needs to be unity and love between the brethren. Turn with me now to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Luke, the ninth chapter. Luke chapter 9. 
This is the story of the transfiguration when Jesus took Peter, James, and John on a mountain and Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus to strengthen him for his ministry. And as Jesus comes down from the mountain, he is met by a father whose only son is ill. He is devil possessed. And he says, I brought him to your disciples, but in verse 40, but they could not help. And now look, let's look at verses 41 to 43. And Jesus answering this man said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. Jesus healed that young man. And the verse immediately after that story is Luke chapter 9 and verse 46. Verse 46 says, then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest. So long as there was disunity, so long as they were vying with one another for a sense of importance in Jesus' ministry, the disciples were powerless. But mind you, these same men, these disciples, these same men, only a few months later, what tremendous power God gave them when they were united. Disunity, powerless. United, power. They had power, Acts the fifth chapter says, to heal the sick and to raise the dead. Acts the second chapter says that 3,000 converts were won in a single day. History suggests that in the first hundred years of the existence of that early Christian church, somewhere between five and 10 million people were converted to Christianity. This the result of unity between the brethren in the church. Turn, if you will, please, to the book of John, the Gospel of John, and the 17th chapter. We read part of that for our scripture reading and our responsive reading. John chapter 17. Jesus was closing his earthly ministry and he prays now his parting prayer for his disciples and for his church. And notice that Jesus did not pray that the church would be large. Sometimes we think there is success in the church if there are more people in the church. Jesus never prayed that the church would be large. Jesus never prayed that the church would be rich. Sometimes we think if we just had a little more money, Jesus never prayed for a wealthy church. Rather, he prayed for oneness in the church. Let's read it here in John chapter 17. Let's start with verse 20 and go through verse 23. John, the 17th chapter, beginning with verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, for his disciples, but also for us, for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, 
and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Did you look at the number of times that Jesus used the word one in that passage? One, one, that they might be one. The great concern of Jesus as he left his church was a concern for unity. Brothers and sisters, the devil doesn't care how much talent there is in the church. The devil doesn't care how many influential people there are in the church, just so long as he can keep those people from pulling together, he knows that nothing is going to happen. Have you ever been to the fair and seen those great giant workhorses? You know, those big Belgians or Clydesdales with the feet the size of a large dinner plate? Just enormous. If you've ever been up close to one, I had the opportunity to have the Budweiser team that came in to see our Vista. And we came in to see that because they were showing it to the public you know, when they were in their stalls and everything. I think they were going to be part of a parade the next day. So I got right up to them and got to touch them and just see them. And they're just stand way up here. Just these enormous, just powerful, powerful workhorses. Now take two of those great muscular horses. Harness them and hitch them to a load. Let's say a load of 100 pounds. Boys and girls, can they pull the load? That would be nothing for them, right? Here we have two big workhorses hitched to a 100-pound load. Can they pull the load? Not if they're pulling in opposite directions. They can't. There's a great deal of dust stirred up in the air. And a whole lot of perspiration that happens. And the only thing that'll happen is that somebody winds up patching harness. Take two strong, creative, thinking people with overwhelming talent and put them together in a church. Put them to the load. Can they pull it? Not if they're pulling in opposite directions. The tragedy is that too many pastors today are spending most of their time patching harness. And if the talent in the church is pulling in opposite direction and the load doesn't get pulled, and if the pastors are spending their time patching harness as a result, how is the church going to move? Love attracts. I'm sure all of us have been around one of those outdoor floodlights at night and you know in the summertime. We don't quite have the same problem with bugs out here that we used to have when we lived in Texas. We lived there for a number of years. But at certain times of the year in Texas you couldn't get it within 20 feet of those big outdoor lights in any direction without getting overwhelmed with those tiny little gnat-like insects. You know, you could just see like a cloud of them all attracted to the light. They would get up your pant legs and in your ears, and up your nostrils and in your eyes. They were just all over, attracted by the light. In such a way, men and women are attracted by love. And if you will set in a given community a light that we call a church, and if you will have love within that church, you will attract people just like gnats are attracted to the light. People love to be where they feel loved. Why is it that the tavern is full while the church is empty? Because, folks, sometimes the tavern is the friendliest place in town. Meanwhile, over at the church, they're preaching against the evils of alcohol in an atmosphere that is so cold you could ice skate down the center aisle. We don't like to admit this, especially about ourselves, of course, 
but it's a long and well-established fact that people choose churches mostly on the basis of fellowship. Now you may feel that you're here today because of a set of beliefs, but if you felt no fellowship here, you wouldn't likely be here for long. I suspect that each one here could think of an incident that has kept a new visitor from returning to church. I know that I could think of a few, but I've known other families who have gone to an Adventist church just once and they said, we want to be a part. We want to be members. We know right off the bat, we want to be part of this church because we feel such a friendship here. I know a lot of families and individuals who maybe live just a few blocks away from an Adventist church and maybe they decide to go to a different one and drive a half an hour or an hour away just because they feel attracted to the fellowship that's there at that church. We have such a need for fellowship. And unfortunately, I can think of several incidents in my life where Adventists and churches that I've attended have even joined another denomination. And typically they'll say something like, we don't really believe the beliefs of that church, but they're so friendly. Do you suppose anybody isn't here today because they don't think we're friendly? Let me tell you something, almost to a man, almost to a woman, those who are visited that are known as backsliders would tell us that that's exactly why they're not here. Because as true as it is that people choose churches mostly on the basis of fellowship, it is even more true that people attend church mostly on the basis of fellowship. Show me someone in this community who may be a member or a former member of this congregation or of this denomination who no longer attends, and I will show you someone who does not feel wanted. People who do not feel a fellowship stop coming. Oh, how we need unity and love and acceptance in the church. And let's not appease our consciences by saying that these people are just careless or that they're just irreligious. They are not here because they are not convinced that we want them here. The book, Testimonies to Ministers, page 188. When there is love manifested by brother to brother, there will be proportionate force and power in our work for the salvation of men. Isn't that something? When there is love manifested by brother to brother, not love believed in, not love taught about, but love manifested. How much love do you and I manifest? How much love do we show? How much do we reveal? But on the other hand, disunity stunts spiritual growth. A friend of mine from work planted some corn a number of years ago. And he had never had a garden before, and so he was really excited. I sensed, you know, just that excitement, you know, just like when kids, when they first start a little garden, they plant some seeds and they come up and they start growing. There's a sense of excitement as the growth occurs. And so he was very excited about watching his corn grow, and he watered it, of course, to get it started, but he had planted the seeds in such a time that he thought, well, most of the growth will happen during the monsoon season. And so he kind of stopped watering. He was waiting for the rain to kind of take over because nothing makes stuff grow like a good rain. But that particular year, it didn't rain enough or soon enough. And he didn't have enough water on his crops. 
And when it came time to have sweet corn, he brought in a sample of his harvest to me, and he was so disappointed. The ears had hardly put on any kernels at all. There were just a few little nubbins there. Because when there's drought, there's no growth. And as you look carefully into your own heart today, if you have not been growing as you would like, if you are not finding yourself day by day, week by week, year by year, closer and closer to Christ, may I suggest that there is probably some bitterness or anger, some hurting, some resentment way down deep within your mind and heart that creates a wedge between you and a brother or sister. I urge you today to take that to the Lord in prayer. You cannot grow until it is removed because where there is unity, there is growth and there is power. Secondly, not only must there be unity between the brethren in the church, there must be unity also between the people and their leaders. We're not going to take the time to turn to it, but Exodus, the 17th chapter, gives us a beautiful story of two ways to look at the leadership. It starts with the Israelites camped at Rephidim, and there wasn't any water. Now, we live in the desert. We know what it's like to not have any water. Could you imagine perhaps a couple of million people and their flocks and herds being out in the middle of the desert and not having any water. I mean, that's legitimately cause for concern, for panic. There's no water. I mean, the water company will give me notice usually in advance and turn off the water. And if it's off for a couple hours, it's like, Oh, thank goodness, we got water again for <laughs> these people out in the middle of a desert, in the heat of the desert, with no water. And so they began to complain. Moses thought for a while that they were going to stone him. All you wanted to do was get us out here in the desert, kill us all off, gather up the leftovers, and go back to the palace a rich man. Complaint criticism against the leadership. But see, the latter part of that very same chapter, Exodus, the 17th chapter, the same chapter talks about the other attitude toward leadership. The Amalekites came and Moses sent Joshua out to fight. And Moses stood up on the hill holding aloft the rod of God. But his hand got tired and so gradually his arms began to fall and everybody noticed that when the rod came down the Amalekites were winning and when the rod was up Israel was winning and so Aaron and Hur got hold of a rock and they rolled it beneath Moses and set him down and they got one on one side and one on the other and they each held up an arm until the going down of the sun the Bible says and God's people won a great victory now you and I are in one of those two stories. We fall under one of those stories. What is your attitude toward the leadership? Do you criticize? Do you complain? Or do you hold up the hands of the leaders in the church? We don't know much about her in this story. Yet when God took a look at what he saw that day, he said, put that man in the book because here is a gift worth preserving. And I don't know what you feel your gift to be, but is there anybody here that could not hold up the hands of the leadership in the church? Which story is the story of your life? You know, you don't have to be perfect to work for God. How would you like to have had David, that murderer and adulterer, 
for the general conference president. He was, you know. How would you like to have had Moses, also a murderer, to teach your kids at school? That great lawgiver, that fellow who was so quick with the rod. Yet God was able to use them in mighty ways. God has never been able to find perfect people, not even for the leadership of the church. But God's been able to use what he found for his glory. If we could just learn the lesson from the old cow, you know, she comes to the manger and a little cheap, poor hay has just been thrown in. What does the cow do? Just stick her nose in the air and says, not for me, not good enough. Not if she's hungry, she doesn't. She gets that slimy nose busy going round and round and round. Down she goes past the thistles, past the clot of dirt, past the moldy hay until way down there someplace she finds something good and she comes up chewing contentedly. Don't you think that's a Christian way to look at leadership? To overlook the bad because no one's perfect and to accept the good and to be an encouragement and a support and a help to the leadership. Brethren and sisters, it was criticism of the leadership that split the heavenly church. It was criticism of even the absolutely perfect leadership that brought sin into our universe. And it is criticism of the leadership that keeps disunity in our church today. But how can we improve the church if we don't criticize when there's a problem? After all, we just stated that we have an imperfect leadership. The church, scripture tells us, is a woman. And husbands, I hope you learned long before now that just about the only way to change a woman is to love her. You can criticize her and you can tell her everything you think she's doing that you don't like from now until your 50th anniversary, except you probably wouldn't make it. She's not going to change much. But bless her heart, she'll do just about anything for love to keep that union, to preserve that relationship. Of course the church needs to grow. Of course the church needs to improve. But the only person that can clean up the church is the person who really loves the church. You can only clean up the church from the inside, not by leaving and then criticizing and complaining. The Bible also compares the church to a body. The parts of the body are very different, very separate, and yet they all have one purpose. And when it comes to about this time of day, I'll be stopping here soon, I start to get an empty feeling in my stomach, right? And then I look at the clock and I see it's about dinner time. Soon I will hear the busyness coming from the kitchen. I will hear that. And then I will follow my nostrils into the dining room. Now these four senses surely perceive the meal altogether differently, each from the other. And yet individually different as they are, they all have one purpose, and that's to get me to the table. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then I get to enjoy the fifth sense of the taste with all the great cooks we have here in the Wilcox Church. In the church, we don't have to think alike. We don't have to be alike. God forbid that only a certain type of personality should fit in the church. But we, like the early Christian church, must be one in purpose. The single purpose of every member of the church must be to help the world learn to love Jesus. That's our purpose. And then thirdly, 
There must be unity and love not only between the brethren. There must be unity and love not only between the people and their leaders. There must also be unity with Christ. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 15. John the 15th chapter. John 15, verses 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. When I was first starting to garden over 30 years ago, I was pretty new, had a lot to learn. But I planted a number of fruit trees, and each one had a little band around them, a little label that wrapped around the trunk to identify the kind of tree, maybe the kind of rootstock that it was grafted onto, whatever. And there was a little warning on there. It said, you know, do not keep this on the tree, basically, for very long. And I kept them on the tree for very long. <laughs> and some of them, it wasn't a problem. You know, they kind of fell off or I removed them. But some I forgot about. And they got kind of down close to the ground and got covered by the leaves or whatever. And I didn't notice that they were still there wrapped around the trunk. And as the trunk began to grow, that constricted the trunk and got tighter. And it wasn't until I found some damage happening to some of the trees that I began to look and I actually lost a couple of trees just because that little label had not been removed shortly after I planted it. It happened so gradually, so imperceptibly my friend, is there any obstruction today between yourself and Christ? Is there any attitude of criticism, of disunity, of rebellion, of resentment toward anyone that is coming between yourself and your Savior? It could be somebody in the church. It could be somebody in your own home. It's an emergency. It may not destroy your religious experience immediately, but it is ultimately still a matter of life and death. And so every day, work on your connection with the source of life, Jesus Christ. Don't let any restrictions keep you from that communion. Just like Jesus said, abide in me, stay attached to the vine. Just keep that connection. Do that every day as we're just coming just short of another year beginning. That's the most important resolution that any of us can make is that every day we spend time with Jesus, growing, keeping that connection with God. And so the church has for a long time, for too long a time, been going through its spiritual drought. We need the latter rain, and it cannot come until there is unity. Where does this leave you today? I invite you to join hands with one another, to join hands with our leaders, and above all, to join hands with Christ. And then the drought will end and the rain will fall. Some years ago on the prairies of Canada, mother opened the door of the house to call her little five-year-old daughter in to supper. She called and she called and there was no response. She became frightened and ran out to the barn but the little girl wasn't there either. 
and so a search party was quickly formed. Back and forth, they combed over those immense, immense prairies to no avail. All night long, they searched for the little girl. All the next day, the next night, the following day, until finally on the third day, the constable called the search party together and he said to the father, I am so sorry. But these men have gone virtually without sleep. We have looked everywhere. She is simply not to be found. We are going to have to give up the search. Oh, the idea was unthinkable in the mind of that father. Oh, please, please, we know she's got to be someplace. Let's give it one more chance. But we've looked every place. Listen, said the father, there's one thing we have not done. Couldn't we form just one long line so close together that we could all join hands? And couldn't we just comb down through the fields together again, hand in hand? They couldn't say no. And so they formed an immensely long line, hand in hand. And sure enough, they've gone a surprisingly short distance. When one of the men looked down and there, almost buried beneath a giant tuft of prairie grass, he saw a leg protruding. And the little girl was found. But the cold nights and the exposure had been too much. She was dead. And they placed her in the outstretched hands of her father. And that poor man, turning his eyes toward heaven, the tears streaming down his face, he cried over and over, Oh God, why didn't we join hands sooner? Today, may I ask you that same question? Oh God, why didn't we join hands sooner? Our closing hymn is number 260. Your bulletin actually has the responsive reading listed again. Number 260 in your hymnal, Hover o'er me, Holy Spirit. Beautiful old hymn. We're going to sing together stanzas one, two, and four. And then for the benediction, I will read stanza three. And as we do so, I'm going to invite each one of us just to pull in together and to join hands together as we have the benediction today. Number 260, the first, the second, and the fourth stanzas, please. All right. Jamar and her children, so glad to see you here today. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Third stanza says, we are weakness, full of weakness. At your sacred feet we bow. Blessed, divine, eternal spirit, fill with love and fill us now. Fill us now, fill us now. Jesus, come and fill us now. Fill us with your hallowed presence. Come, O oh come, and fill us now. Dear Lord, we ask that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit just now. Unify us. Unite our hearts in Christian love. May us in our individual family units be united. May we as a church family be united. May we as a 
as your people be united. Empower us to help the world learn to love Jesus. Is my prayer in Jesus' loving name. Amen.